very full. This is so exciting just to be here, just to be loved. Montana, thank you for your well wishes for the community. And I just want to say a special thank you for noticing, for paying attention, and for practicing love. And I was laughing earlier when Melanie was talking about the kind of community that we are. And Judy, I didn't know that was one of your quotes. We should put that on the bulletin, right? We love us. Is that what? I love us. I love us. Because for me, being able to go with the flow, being able to simply be present with what is happening, that is practicing love. No matter what the circumstances are, no matter what shows up, it's not about doing it a certain way. It's not about having to get it right. It's tr truly paying attention. It was interesting, earlier this week, Ash and I had a couple of conversations with text and phone and, and whatnot to co-create this experience today. And we were going back and forth. And ultimately, to me, and I think we all continue to learn this with the talks that Melanie has done, what this community is about, that cultivating love, a practice of love truly begins with us. There were many analogies that I could have used this morning from going to the gym and working out, or, or not even going to the gym and working out, because a lot of people would run from that. But the garden, I thought, would be a really wonderful analogy to use about cultivating. Because to me, what that implies, at least for me, that word cultivate is, oh, I'm growing something. I'm beginning to you know, put some energy into it, put some love into it. I have a desire for it. And so I thought, okay, what does all that mean? Because we all are probably going to cultivate it a bit differently. If we all went out here and, and we picked a little plot of land to claim and to grow, or we had a community garden, we would all look at that a bit differently as to how we would plan it out, would we not? We might would have our favorites. And we would think, okay, let me check out the elements. Because as I'm creating a practice of something, I'm cultivating something, I have to pay attention to what's happening around me. What are the elements that are necessary? What are the ingredients that are essential to create resilience, strength, stamina, and to be able to handle whatever would affect that garden? I need to pay attention to the sunlight. I need to notice what's happening with the soil. I need to notice, are we having water? Or if we're living in California, we better find a way, right, to face a circumstance. And right now, let's just send them love. And everybody dealing with so many conditions now that are being affected with Mother Nature, truly. So at times, I think the practice of love is saying, how do I approach this? What's going to work for me in myself so that I can nurture the whole self, all of us, as community? Buddha reminds us, let the disciple cultivate love without measure toward all beings. Let him cultivate toward the whole world, above, below, around, a heart of love, unstinted. For in all the world, this state of heart is best. To me, when you think about a practice, be it your spiritual practice, any kind of practice, what's important initially is laying a foundation. So we go out there and we say, okay, we have this area that we're going to cultivate, and this is our garden. I think of that as our heart space. I think of going within and taking a look at when was the last time I went in to check out my heart space? What has taken place in there? What's been going on? Have I been present with it? So if I go out and I look at this piece of, of land, this area, and I say, wow, what's been happening here? Perhaps there's debris, there's rocks, there's old roots, stuff that I need to commit to then I need to say, hmm, what's my plan? What are the tools, what are the things that I need to, what, clear out this clutter? Go in and dig up the debris? Till the soil of my soul? What needs to happen? Am I prepared to do that? So to me, when I think of creating a practice, there's a preparation phase that happens. 
and that's much like the garden. I wanted to share about my dad. He had a green thumb, and actually he grew up on a farm. He was born in Alabama, raised in Texas, and then he enlisted in the Air Force for 20-something years. But one of the things I always remember about my dad was how he loved to garden. And my dad had a tough life insofar as he had some mental health issues, and he really didn't know how to relate to the world out there. But in his world, in that garden, oh my goodness. I just loved what came forth from him when he was in his garden. Because he was pure love. And when he had a tomato to offer you, or a cucumber, or green beans, or whatever was produced out of that bounty, he couldn't give you enough. He was so full of passion. He was so full of joy that it just overflowed from him. And I'll never forget when Chevrolet, I think, came out with a little love truck, but it was L-U-V. Yeah. You remember that? Some of you recall that? My dad bought one of those first love trucks, and I think it's funny that it was a love truck. I think it stood for light utility vehicle, but we can make up <laughs> another metaphor, I think, that would work perfectly. And I'll remember at the end of the season, when he would have so many tomatoes, he could not give away enough tomatoes. So he would take them and put them in his little pickup truck. And he practically gave them away. In fact, he felt bad charging people for them, but my mom was over here going, you need to charge people something, right? So I don't know what he charged for it, but the point was, that was his passion. That was his practice. Because my dad would not be able to sit down with you and have a conversation about his heart. He didn't have the languaging and the words and, and the sense of himself to feel like he could express himself. So he did it in different ways. He did it in ways that, you know, a lot of us would say, yes, thank you, Bill, for this delicious tomato. Thank you for the bounty of your garden. And he, once again, he did it with such joy and such gratitude that it was such a delight to see my father so full of love and the way in which he chose to express it. I think a good question to ask ourselves, whether we want to grow a garden, whether there's something else that we have in mind, is do I want to become a better lover, a practitioner of love? Do I really want that? Or do I feel like it's asking too much of me? Am I perhaps still caught in a story of, I want people to give to me. I need this and I need that. And why does that happen to that person but not happen to me? And I think sometimes in our humanness, we block that flow. We block ourselves from the opportunity to be able to truly cultivate what is waiting for us, what's already there. It would be like going out to the garden and saying, this is too much work. I don't have a clue. This is not my thing. Your dad, Jeannie, he must have been you know, great at gardening and he loved it, but that's not my thing. My point is, is to listen to whatever it is that's happening around you, right? <laughs> whatever that may be, an outer voice and inner voice that's calling you to what? Pay attention. It's calling you to learn. It's calling you to take a breath and decide. Love to me is more than an intention. We hear that word a lot. I said an intention. Okay, so we're all going to go out there today. Oh, by the way, I just have to comment. Chris said today, she, I reminded her of Lord's Welk. And I said, I will bring bubbles next time, I promise you. <laughs> it's the right shoes. And I thought, ooh, maybe Pat Boone, right? Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Right. So, exactly, <laughs> Pat Boone. But I do have bubbles, so prom I promise you I'll bring those next time. Okay, so we're going to go out there, and where was I? I just like, whoop, there it went. We're out there. Yeah, we're out there in the garden. We're out there getting ready to uh, pick out what it is we want and, and to make that decision. And we have to decide. Do we want to become a better lover? And what is required? What do I have to learn? Am I willing to do the work? Because I can set that intention. And I can say, great. I want to grow a garden. And I can envision. Because to me, setting an intention 
you, there's a lot of things you need to, to pair together and partner together to me to really have the demonstration of what it is that you want. So I can say, great, I've been to the Law of Attraction classes, and I've listened to all that stuff out there, and I've got my intention, and I just love it, and I think it's strong and powerful. Great. How's that working for you? Do you think if you set that intention for the garden, and you just put it out there and you release it to the universe, and I'm not mocking the things that we're taught, trust me, because I'm right there in there with you with my sleeves rolled up and my gloves on and my boots, and I'm doing the work with you. I'm in there cultivating and tilling the soil and doing the hard work. Get all that stuff out of there because that's what's required. How can I, in any moment, be responsive to something if I have not practiced what it is that I say I want to create? If I have just set that intention and released it to the universe and I believe that there's a loving universe and God is good and all of those things that we hear, what about me? What am I doing? We can, as we hear sometimes, get so busy at doing that we forget to be a human <coughs> being. That's a whole other conversation and a whole other talk. But right now, I'm talking about putting kind of like your feet to your prayers. You have to take the steps. You have to do the work in order to be able to say, yes, I'm experiencing love. I'm becoming love. My love muscles are getting stronger and more resilient. And in that place of being stronger and resilient, I'm also very flexible. Because love, to me, brings that to you. It softens those places within, like it did with my dad. It opens your heart. So when you go inside and you look at this heart space, and you say, I want to cultivate more love. What do I need to do in my life? What do I need to take a look at? Where is my focus? Rumi reminds us, let the beauty, <clears throat> let the beauty you love be what you do. There are a hundred ways to kneel and kiss the ground. There are so many ways for you to say, I want to create a practice. And in order to do that, I have to what? Practice, practice, practice. How do you think Asha and the band do what they do every week? We get better at it only when we put the time and energy, effort, commitment. The question I think we often skip over is, what do I desire? Is it truly burning in my heart? Do I have a passion for this? I know when I work with, with people about getting in better shape and losing weight and all of that, and they hear my story and what happened, they go, what did you do? And I'll say, I made different choices. I started moving my body. I started doing things differently than what I used to do before because I wanted an outcome that truly allowed me to feel better. Like the quote on the front of your bulletin today with Maya Angelou. Have you read that this morning? When you are practicing love, sometimes there isn't anything you need to do or say. Just be. Just like Jesus. And the energy. A lot of the ascended masters. The energy that exuded, that emanated from him. All he had to do was be there. That's how we hold space. That's how you can say, yes, in the garden of my heart, there is a space full of grace, full of generosity, full of kindness and compassion. These are the things that I'm growing, the things that I'm cultivating. But it's my responsibility to go in and what? Tend my garden. Remember, it's, from, it's moving from intention to what I would call 
fruition. It's going through this process and knowing that as I do these things, as I plant the seeds in this soil, what is the substance contained? What's contained in that substance? Am I fertilizing my garden with faith? Am I fertilizing with fear? We know what that does. And it's okay because part of fear is part of the human experience. There are many things that we engage in as part of the journey. But to me, it's what I'm conscious of in that moment. And I become more conscious as I what? Practice. I become more alert. I become more aware. Like meditation. Like many other practices, like prayer. To be able to go from beseeching prayer to affirmative prayer. If that's what calls to you. If that's what resonates with you. To be able to meditate. Sometimes people go, oh, I don't know how to meditate. I can't get it right. And I say, you know what? Get out of your head and go into your heart. Go into the core and essence of you. Just breathe. That's a starting point. Just breathe. That's love. To me, your breath is love. Is God breathing you. So what are you cultivating in your heart space right now? If you went in there and took a look, perhaps you might find some, I don't know, resentment still hanging around? Some residue of what has been before? Perhaps some unforgiveness? And not only for others, but for yourself. So we begin to acknowledge those things and say, I want to live, as I read recently, a heartfelt yes in every moment of my life so that that light of love can emanate from me and the garden of my heart is just overflowing. There's a bounty because like my dad, he had endless things to offer people. And there was such joy in it to where I could say, okay, Judy, okay, Gay, here, I have something to offer you today from my heart. Rather than saying, oh, I don't know, I think if I give some of my love away, I'm not going to, what, get any back. To be able to live from that place of freedom. To me, love is freedom. It's being able to, I was thinking of Josh, actually, that Renee brought in here earlier. The Pyrenees. You notice how animals, they're just free. Do you think they're thinking, well, if I give her some of my unconditional love today, I don't know if I'm going to get any back. I might be barking up the wrong tree. Uh, right? Ooh, I, <laughs> I might be doing that. But no. They live from their heart. They just offer it freely. And have you noticed how easy it is to offer it in return, perhaps to animals sometimes more so than people? Have you ever noticed that? I've worked with animal dogs for the last 10 plus years, and they call me the dog genie sometimes, and it's been fascinating to watch how we do that, how we are with people, and how we are with animals. We just kind of, and you know what, we let them see us. Just like we are. It's just so much fun. Practicing love, I know when I first came up with the title, I thought, well, I'm gonna think, are you about practicing? I don't want to practice. I want to get out there and do it. It's like becoming, I said earlier, a love practitioner. To where at every moment, every word you speak, every breath you breathe, love is your expression. <clears throat> I do appreciate Marianne Williamson a few years ago when she wrote what she did. And I believe that it was, somebody else had, had uh, credit for it. But I wanted to remind you of this. And you probably know what I'm going to read. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear, please forgive me, I, I think the garden is starting to be <laughs> Our deep, in a, in a wonderful way. Things are flowing, are they not? Yes. Yeah. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light. Not our darkness that most frightens us. 
Who am I to be brilliant, we ask ourselves. Gorgeous, talented, fabulous. Actually, who are you not to be? You are the divine expression, are you not? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. And it does not serve you. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking <clears throat> so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine. Each and every one of us. No exception. No exception. As we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. To me, that's what practicing love is. Because when I show up like that, and you can experience God, the divine, that beautiful, beautiful energy, to me, it melts away the resistance that we have. It allows us to truly touch beyond our humanity, but the very core of not just who, because that's personality, but what we are, our true essence. We are liberated from our own fear. Our presence automatically liberates others. I think it's time to become a master gardener. I know in the whole horticulture circle, some of you may be familiar with what a master gardener is. And you become that as you learn and you educate. But you have to know a little bit about your landscape. You have to know more about what really resonates with you. And if the soil out there or the soil in here is not appropriate for what it is that I'm growing, it's time to add some what? Compost? Some humus? The substance, once again. And that's what I really want you to, to really notice today. What are you adding in? What are the experiences that you are choosing every single day? Are they enriching the soil of your soul, of your heart? What is the pH? That's a really important thing to pay attention to, to have the right balance and harmony within and without, so that the perfect environment is able to cultivate and grow exactly what it is. Not just that your heart desires, but your soul already knows. It already knows why you came here. It already knows what you yearn for. I just think that is so awesome. And I have to say, too, on a more personal note, and being transparent this morning, I've really been struggling lately with practicing love for myself. Out here, that's easy. I can tap into something else and escape. But whew, sometimes that stuff inside is hard. I would have thought I would have lost some weight by now, you know, because it's been hard work. But it's okay. I know that there are certain things that work for me. So when I allow those to come to me and say, yes, I don't have to be strong. I don't have to do anything. Just let it be. Wow. It's amazing how fast it'll come and how quickly it's turned around. Because I know my faith is strong, although lately I've wavered on that. And I go, oh my gosh, Jamie, here you are, you're speaking on Sunday. Here you are, people see you as, as you know, this person who's always strong. And that's why I posted even this week what I did about Robin Williams. When people saw him on the outside and what was happening on the inside, to take time to really practice love. How much does it take to reach out to somebody? How much does it take to notice and I promise you, if you are not caring for you, and you're not practicing love for you, it ain't going to happen. And not because I believe you don't want it to. You're just not going to have it to offer. 
That's part of the journey, folks. That's what makes us stronger. That's going through, as Sydney's spoken many times, about that tunnel, about the light. It's knowing that there is a light. It's knowing that tomorrow, today may have been a darker day or a tough day, but the sun's going to shine. I know when I learned about Don DeCenza, my mind went back to the times when I first met him and Carol at Unity North. And I loved when he would play, and then he kind of did his own thing with his own group when he left Unity North and retired. But Don always made me just tap into that creative essence of energy. He practiced love and is practicing love now. There are many different ways in which we do it. So we can give ourselves permission to know that I can plant that garden and I can do everything that I have taught myself, that I've learned, that I've educated myself about that's essential to grow this garden. But you know what? I may come out there tomorrow morning. Maybe the rabbits have eaten it and I don't have anything. Maybe there's been a tornado, like all the folks that are dealing with the weather disasters again, and it has just swept it away. So to me, it calls me back to say, okay, what do I believe in? How do I practice love right now? Can I just be in this moment? And that's why living in the moment has truly helped me so much right now to not live it any faster. Not even one day at a time, but one moment at a time. That's how I practice love. Because it's flowing through me, moment by moment by moment. Desire, commitment, faith, enthusiasm. I love that word always, in theos, in God. To be passionate about that garden to take pride in it and know that when you experience what is coming out of the soil and substance of your garden, of your heart, the more love there is, the more love there is. And we know that like attracts like. And we are truly in that flow. I've learned more so lately too to truly put my practice of gratitude into motion and by a journal. I talk about it all the time with clients, but to me, to create a journal, to truly write down every moment, every time, what is happening that truly supports me and sustains me. I wanted to end, actually, and you're familiar with this too, the Anyway poem by Mother Teresa. Did you know the original poem, though, was not by Mother Teresa? It was actually by Kent, Dr. Kent M. Keith. And it was written in 1968. His version is a little bit different, so I'm going to go back and forth as I move down. His was kind of interesting. Um, so perhaps I will read you his whole thing and then just put some pieces of, of uh, Mother Teresa in there. Because what I want you to walk away with today is to know, no matter what, love anyway. Yourself first. Practice. You know, we think sometimes I have to practice because I have to get it perfect, right? Sometimes that will deter us. It's not practicing until you get it perfect. It's knowing that it's already perfect as you practice it. You can never get it wrong. And that's what I reminded myself of this past week. Love is always perfect. People are illogical, unreasonable, and self-centered. Love them anyway. If you do good, people will accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Do good anyway. If you are successful, you will win false friends and true enemies. Succeed anyway. Her version was, if you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. The good you do today will be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Honesty and frankness make you vulnerable. People may cheat you. Be honest and frank 
anyway. The biggest men and women with the biggest ideas can be shot down by the smallest men and women with the smallest minds. Think big anyway. What you spend years building may be destroyed overnight. Build anyway. People really need help but may attack you. If you do help them, help people anyway. Give the world the best you have and it may never be enough. Give the world the best you have. And remember the first one. Love them anyway. And most of all, bring it back to you. If you're not familiar with the, what they call, it's called the Paradoxical Commandments, is what Kent Keith wrote, and then it's called the Anyway Poem by Mother Teresa. I really invite you to go back and read that and to apply it to yourself. That no matter what is going on in your life, no matter what you've done, to go back in and take a look at the garden of your heart and maybe it's time to get in there, excavate, cultivate, till up that soil and begin to sow seeds of love. Maybe we could all come here one time in our, in our work, garden work clothes and roll up our sleeves and put on our work boots. We're already doing that here in case you haven't noticed because you're right in the middle of cultivating the most amazing garden and it takes every single one of you and the community to be able to have a love to share and to know that one world truly is practicing love in every moment.